Um, cannabinoids and cancer, uh, obviously you all know that it's been used in cancer patients and it's been used successfully in cancer patients to help not only the nausea and vomiting that they see with chemotherapy, but also the pain and some of the suffering that they have with, um, with, uh, with the disease. Interestingly enough, uh, if you sort of look at it from a roundabout way, if you can help them eat better and you can help them take their medications better, you may actually see a reduction in cancer because they're more compliant with the therapy. Um, it's sort of the same uh, concept we had a, about 10 years ago. We discovered the mechanism of hot flashes. Hot flashes are the number one reason why patients discontinue tamoxifen. Tamoxifen is one of the most popular drugs that's used for breast cancer. 50% of breast cancer patients get off of tamoxifen because they can't stand the hot flashes. Now imagine if we can keep those 50% on, you've reduced cancer by potentially 50%. And so we discovered the mechanism behind it and a way to immediately reduce those hot flashes um, because of a central effect through a procedure um, that we do. Same concept can be used with, uh, with medical cannabis. If you become more compliant with your regimen, uh, you could potentially reduce the disease burden even more. Medical cannabis and fibromyalgia, fibromyalgia, is a type of pain that some people think it's a neuropathic pain condition. It's actually considered a central pain condition. Fibromyalgia is a central pain disorder. It's when your, your brain literally starts misinterpreting signals and, and it causes a whole cascade of events that I won't get into here, but a whole cascade of events that uh, results in full wide, wide body, widespread pain. That then starts actually affecting even your immune system. As we all know, the endocannabinoid system works on the neurological system as well as the immune system. So some of these patients, we start saying, you start seeing they're more sick. They get more infections. Uh, they can't fight things as easily. And it all stems from certain changes that occur in the brain. Well, we've seen medical cannabis that's been helpful in patients with fibromyalgia. Medical cannabis has been helpful in patients who have had migraines as well. Uh, there's long established history uh, and data on this, as we talked about in the very beginning. It's been used for thousands of years on headaches. Waxing and waning usage for the last 1,200 years, obviously in the last 100 years in America, it's obviously waned. But it's on the way back up. You know, patients who have these severe migraine headaches, what are their options right now? There are a few options, but what do they do in that immediate setting? Uh, medical cannabis has been um, helpful in, in alleviating and being uh, abortive with some uh, migraines, uh, which has obviously been very helpful. Anyone who's had a migraine before knows how incredibly debilitating those can be. Uh, medical cannabis and the anti-emetic effect. Again, uh, we, we all know this, but just uh, if anyone ever asked, there are actually studies, the randomized clinical trials that have shown that natural and synthetic THC has been superior to placebo. And um, in many situations, patients actually prefer uh, the cannabis products uh, to some of the other products that are out there, and obviously definitely prefer it to just suffering and throwing up all day long, right? So cannabis independence. So we've talked about obviously, I mean, there are a lot, there's a lot of science behind its usefulness, a lot of science behind how it can help. And one of the questions we always get is, okay, um, and this is, this is like probably the most controversial slide on the deck because everyone's gonna be like, well, wait, wait a minute. Um, so we do see dependence, but it's a psychological dependence. So very different than like, you know, um, alcohol or nicotine or opioids where you have a chemical dependence because of receptor activation and receptor binding. We see more of a, of a uh, psychological dependence. Um, so we see two, three things. We see one, a, pre a preoccupation with the acquisition of the drug. So we see patients who, who, who just keep thinking about when is their next, you know, joint, when's their next hit, you know, when are they going to, and uh, they stop focusing on what's, what's really important in, in life. So that's, that's number one. Um, that sort of goes to that whole uh, old uh, adage of stoner, if you will. Um, and there were some movies about that. What was that? I think it was like Fast Times at Ridgemont High or something like that. Anyway, um, but pre-acquisition, pre preoccupation of just getting it without, without a real reason why. Um, compulsive use of the drug and then relapse to or recurrent use of the drug. Um, some patients, or some people, I won't call them patients, but some people have um, used it as, a, as, even though marijuana might not necessarily be a gateway, they've used it as a gateway um, to, because it's easier to acquire than some of the other medications. So those are the kind of things that we see. It's more of an emotional, um, psychological, you know, dependence for a variety of reason, uh, not necessarily a, a receptor um, uh, dependence that we see, say, with opioids or nicotine or with alcohol. 
Um, and, oh, and finally, you know, some patients, some people are simply genetically predispositioned to having an addictive profile or personality. So that can also be an issue. So early responsiveness uh, determines the, the dependence, okay? What, you know, how did they respond when they first had, can you close the door, please, if you don't mind? Um, some of the early uh, uh, responses that we see, you know, do they, when they first smoke or when they first use this uh, marijuana, okay, specifically, did, did they sort of report this euphoric effect, this high effect? Um, did they use it for purposes that were more reasonable or were they using it for purposes that were more psychological? Um, you know, obviously some people will say they felt happy, but you have to dive between, read between the lines there of what does that happy mean? Happy because their pain was better, their headache was better, this was better, or happy because they just wanted to get blitzed, you know, or something, you know, disconnect from society. Um, the, the, when, as, a, as physicians, when we start seeing patients who want to disconnect from society, that tells us there's an incredible amount of psychological undertone there. And we have to be very careful about making sure we intervene quickly because we don't want them to fall into a, a deep, dark hole. Um, some of the negative responses that were um, uh, unrelated to later dependence, you know, maybe felt ill, dizzy, passed out, uh, felt frightened. Um, when we see those, typically we don't see them uh, getting, developing that psychological dependence. So cannabis and withdrawal, it's not the same type of withdrawal you'll see, say, with an opioid or with alcohol. Those are receptor-dependent withdrawals that can be quite uh, serious, especially alcohol. Alcohol withdrawal can be fatal. Um, this is not that same type of withdrawal. This type of withdrawal, again, uh, there, there, there is some receptor involvement, but really it's more of, again, that psychological withdrawal. If, pe if people are, are um, uh, uh, dependent on cannabis and that's allowed them to eat, it's allowed them to be calm, it's allowed them to, to feel better, obviously taking that away, those symptoms are not only gonna come back, but they're gonna feel worse because of that, that, that sensitization that's occurred centrally. Um, if they're uh, taking it for other reasons and more psychological reasons, that's where that anxiety, that's where the agitation might come back in, even violent behavior, violent mood might come in because, because of those psychological issues that haven't been addressed correctly.